What's up everybody, Rob here. So in the long and oftentimes tumultuous history between native tribes of North America and white settlers that came from Europe and which eventually became the United States of America, um, certain names and places stand out. Um, names like Tecumseh, uh, Pontiac, Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, uh, places like Wounded Knee, Little Bighorn. These places are all indelibly seared into the minds of Americans and our history. Now while these events are important in their own right, um, they often overshadow another event, uh, one that happened much earlier in American history. In the latter half of the 1600s, what would eventually become the United States were little more than a series of English colonies in the northeastern part of the continent. These colonies would be embroiled in a conflict that would be the deadliest in American history, and very few people know about it. In terms of percentage of the population that would be killed, King Philip's War is the bloodiest conflict in American history. Now, through a combination of limited records, um, the fact that this is very early in American history and um, it eventually being overshadowed by many other events in the ongoing conflict between native tribes and um, white settlers. Um, this particular event is um, often overlooked in history books or if it is put in history books it's given a paragraph at most um, and I don't think that's doing it enough justice. Now I'm not an expert on the subject I just thought this would be interesting and um, yeah so here we go a brief presentation on King Philip's War. When the English arrived in New England in the 1620s, they weren't the original inhabitants. Uh, there were multiple tribes there, including the Wampanoag, the Pequot, the Massachusetts, the Narragansett, the Mohican, and there were others as well, and I'm sure I'll butcher their names as well. Sorry, I have limitations. In any case, they all had different relationships with each other as well as with the English colonists. Now, I'm not going to go into too many details here, but when the Mayflower arrived in 1620, they met the Wampanoag and their chief, um, or Sachem, a uh, man by the name of Massasoit. Um, what happened next is pretty much a Thanksgiving story. You know, they were struggling and then the Indians helped them out. Yeah, you know the deal. I'm not going to go into that. Um, any case, there was generally a fairly amicable relationship between these two groups. Alright, so if we fast forward a few decades, the Wampanoag are now being led by his son, a man by the name of Wamsuta, who was nicknamed Alexander by the colonists, and after his death, his brother took over, a man by the name of Metacomet, who was nicknamed Philip by the colonists. Uh, both Alexander and Philip are references to Alexander the Great of Macedonia and his father, Philip of Macedonia. Colonists thought it was a cool name, and yeah, you can do far worse than being named after the greatest conqueror of all time. So before I go any further, I want to break down some demographics. The English colonies in New England had been expanding very rapidly during the intervening decades, and by the 1670s, the total population was around 80,000 people. About 16,000 of them were eligible for the colonial militia, which was an informal fighting force of citizens. It was just average people gathering together, um, taking weapons really off the mantle place and fighting. Uh, they were not professional soldiers. Um, all able-bodied men were required to join the militia when it was called out. The only exceptions were the old, the infirm, the young, and the clergy. Uh, it's important to note that at this time there were no regular English army troops in the colony, and for all practical purposes the colonies had to rely on themselves for their protection and defense. In contrast, the total Indian population was estimated to be around 10,000 or so. They had suffered very terribly from diseases such as smallpox and measles, that the European settlers had brought with them. So right when hostilities were about to break out, the Indians were already at a major disadvantage, just in terms of sheer numbers. Now in terms of armament, the colonists and the Indians were actually very similarly armed. Uh, the colonists had brought over flintlock technology, uh, the flintlock musket, which was a smoothbore musket, single shot, muzzle loader. Now the Indians did use fire locks as well. They acquired them through trade. Uh, but this also meant that they were dependent on the colonists for gunpowder, since gunpowder is very difficult to manufacture and they didn't have the technology to do so. So this is a further disadvantage for the Indians, since, well, their firearms require trade with the colonists, and if hostilities break out, they're not going to be getting any gunpowder, which turns their muskets into very overly engineered clubs. Furthermore, other Indian weapons, such as steel knives, tomahawks, and um, other such implements, were also traded with the colonies. They didn't have any metalworking of their own, at least not enough to make a weapon out of, so pretty much their entire, I guess you could say, defense infrastructure was heavily reliant on colonial trade which puts them even further on the back foot. Now, while there were some tensions, the Indians and the colonists did coexist relatively peacefully up until about the 1660s. Now, it was about the mid-1660s when tensions were starting to build up. 
As more settlers were arriving from overseas and as the, uh, the natural birth rate was increasing um, from the colonists, they kept encroaching further and further onto Indian land. Now, the Indians were willing to sell land to the, um, to the colonists. Uh, there's this myth that um, Indian tribes didn't really sell land or they didn't believe in ownership. That, that's all. They actually did believe, they believed it was owned by the community in common. This is a vast, vast, vast oversimplification. But basically, the idea of individuals owning land was kind of weird, but um, individual tribes or entities could. So if a tribe decided to sell land to colonists, that was perfectly acceptable. Well, in any case, this constant um, pressure on the Indians from the colonists to give up more and more land was starting to become grating. The colonists were demanding more and more land, land that the Indians were not willing to part with. Now, to make matters worse, the colonists' livestock would often destroy Indian crops, which would put more pressure on the Indians to feed themselves during the winter. Now, this was not done deliberately. Okay, here's the thing about pigs and pig farming. Pigs will eat anything. Seriously, they will eat anything that is digestible. Not edible, digestible. There's a difference. They also have um, very sharp teeth and could absolutely chew through any sort of barrier that the colonials could put up. Um, really, all they had at this point were um, log fences, something like this. and a determined pig would chew through that in a matter of hours. And um, in any case, um, now while the pigs wouldn't necessarily be released on their own, um, the colonists did try to keep them penned up as much as possible, they would inevitably escape and they would go off into Indian lands, destroy Indian livestock and put more pressure on the food supply there. So with these tensions, the inciting incident to all this came in 1675 with the murder of John Sassaman, who was a Wampanoag and more specifically a praying Indian. Uh, praying Indians were Christian converts, and they were often seen as and used as intermediaries between the colonists and the Indians. In any case, Sassamon had warned the colonists of a general uprising planned by the Indians. Metacomet, or King Philip, was brought before the colonials to answer for these charges. Uh, there was very little proof that any sort of attack would occur. It was really just Sassamon's word. But the colonial government made it very clear that if there were any reports of violence at all, trade would be cut off with the Indians. At this point, the Indians were increasingly reliant on trade goods provided by the colonists, like I said before, gunpowder, firearms, steel, tomahawks, and knives, along with other non-military items like iron cook pots and cooking utensils, blankets, textiles, and other manufactured goods that the Indians were increasingly reliant upon. Well, in any case, soon after giving his report, Sassamon was found dead in a pond in January with his neck broken. A few days later, another praying Indian came forward and told the colonials that three Indians had killed Sassamon, though it is very important to note that the witness owed a gambling debt to one of the three that was accused, so make of that whatever you will. Anyway, these three men were captured and questioned. And uh, quite interestingly, they were brought before the corpse of Sassaman, and the corpse started to bleed, which the colonials took to mean a sign of their guilt. You can, again, also make of that whatever you will. In any event, these men were found guilty and were executed on June 8th. As you can imagine, the Wampanoags were not particularly happy about this. They really didn't like this sort of unilateral justice that was imposed on them by the colonists. In response, they attacked and burned several homesteads along the frontier. Now, if the situation within the colonies was a powder keg, that was the spark that lit it all. Now, furthermore, on June 27th, 1675, there was an eclipse of the moon, and many Indians took this as a good sign, or a sign of their impending victory. Now, how an eclipse can be seen as a sign of victory, I honestly have no idea, but hey, it worked for them, so. So the tribes that joined King Philip in his war included his own Wampanoag, as well as the Nipmuc, Podunk, Narragansett, and the Nashua. The colonists that they fought against were part of the New England Confederation, a loose coalition of several separate colonies from England. The Massachusetts Bay Colony, the Plymouth Colony, the New Haven Colony, and the Connecticut Colony. Now, it's important to note that this agreement was more of a loose coalition rather than a single unified front. For all practical purposes, each colony was a separate nation in and of itself. They ultimately were loyal to the English crown, uh, not the British crown, the English crown. Uh, the Act of Union hadn't come around yet, so um, it was still England as a separate entity from Scotland and all that. That's, again, another story for another day. And even though they were in this loose coalition together, that doesn't necessarily mean a unified front against a common enemy. Um, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, a couple decades earlier, actually refused to participate in a colonial venture against New Netherlands, uh, 
which is uh, was a Dutch holding at the time. There was a very brief um, war between the English and the Dutch, um, and the colonies, the English colonies, were to launch a raid on New Netherlands, which is pretty much where I'm standing right now. Uh, but basically, really what I'm trying to get at here is that um, there's not a single unified colonial government in the United States at this point, not formalized at least. Each one was really a separate nation in and of itself, ultimate loyalty to the crown, but really they were on their own. Now, I'm not going to go into detail here about every raid and fight that happened that would take way too long, so here are just some of the highlights. Now, the first major attack against a colonial settlement was on Swansea on June 20th. The colonials retaliated by attacking a Wampanoag settlement at Mount Hope, which is modern-day Bristol, Rhode Island, on June 28th. The attacks continued throughout the summer with Middleborough, Dartmouth, and Menden being attacked, as well as Brookfield and Lancaster. Attacks continued on into September with attacks on Deerfield, Hadley, and Northfield. Now, it had became apparent over the summer that the local militia was unable to deal with the threat, so the New England Confederation officially declared war on the Indians on September 9th. The raids continued and several militia were killed as they escorted a group of wagons from Deerfield to Hanley on September 12th. The war continued on into the fall and winter with the ill-trained militia completely unable to compete with the lightning-fast guerrilla tactics of King Philip. With each victory, more and more Indians joined King Philip's banner. Well, the colonists had an idea to just utterly crush the Indians with one single blow. So they gathered over 1,000 militia and about 150 Indian allies, mostly Mohican and Pequots, and they put them under the command of Josiah Winslow, who was the governor of Plymouth Colony. Now, they targeted the Narragansett. Now, the Narragansett at this point were neutral in the conflict. They weren't actually involved directly, but they did harbor many of King Philip's warriors. So they... The colonists figured that, okay, you're harboring the enemy, you're, um, you're aiding them, therefore you are a legitimate target. Well, the Narragansett saw what was coming, and they got out of Dodge. So they fled from their villages, which the colonials burned to the ground, and they fled to their tribe's stronghold, which was a fort in the swampland near Kingston. Now, in this particular fort was the bulk of the Narragansett tribe. The men, the women, children, the elderly, non-combatants, they were all pretty much gathered at this one spot. The colonials pursued them there, and eventually this led to what was known as the Great Swamp Fight. On December 19th, the colonials and their Indian allies assaulted and completely overran the fort, killing or driving off the inhabitants. It was estimated that anywhere between 300 and 1,000 Indians were killed, including the women, the children, the non-combatants. Of that 300 to 1,000, only about 100 or so were actually warriors. The colonists themselves lost about 70 men, with about twice that number wounded. Because of this, the Narragansett tribe never recovered. Their back was completely broken, and they were no longer a significant force within the colonies. In spite of the Narragansetts being utterly crippled, the attacks continued over the winter of 1675 and 76, with raids on about two dozen settlements. Philip himself led a massive raid on Lancaster, Massachusetts, with about 1,500 Indian warriors. Now, this is an absolutely astronomical number. Now, you have to understand that there, the total Indian population at this point was around 10,000. So, we're talking possibly 15% of the total Indian population, not just the warrior class or of men of fighting age. That was the total population, about 15% were being committed towards this single raid. Well, in any case, the settlement was completely destroyed and about 30 people were killed. So the war continued on throughout the spring of 1676 with the colonists unable to pin down the Indians. Uh, the colonists were really just looking for a straight up military type fight. You know, just um, open fields of Europe, muzzle to muzzle and blasting away at each other, that sort of way. And the Indians were having none of it. And furthermore, the Indians didn't really want to get caught in a single location. Like what happened during the Great Swamp Fight, well, that's a siege. The Europeans have a tremendous amount of experience with sieges. That's pretty standard, uh, standard part of European warfare. So they knew that if they were to do that, they'd be in a lot of trouble. So they would just hit and run, launch lightning guerrilla raids, and not give the colonists something to lash out at. And in spite of large raids like what happened at Lancaster with 1,500 Indians getting involved, the... The native tribes really just didn't have the numbers to actually drive the colonists back or to kill off any large numbers of them. There were just too few, too spread out. They just didn't have the numbers to land a decisive blow against the colonists. So in order to end the conflict, the colonies were forced to adapt. 
they learned that they couldn't rely on that single hammer blow. They, you know, they destroyed the enemy settlement or, you know, um, destroy their main field army and that would just end the conflict. There was no main field army and the Indians, if there was a stronghold, the Indians would just abandon it and pack up and go somewhere else. So the colonists had to learn how to fight a non-traditional, non-European style of warfare. And they did. They made much more extensive use of their Indian allies, mostly the Mohicans, and really just had Indians fight Indians, fight fire with fire. In addition, New England was becoming much more militarized. Now, every settlement had a wall around it, a wooden wall, a palisade of some kind. That was just pretty much standard. But these were becoming much more elaborate, much more effective at keeping out Indian raids. And there would be armed men constantly guarding farm settlements. Uh, so when farmers went out to plant, they would be armed to the teeth. When they traveled from one point to another, uh, you know, trading goods or doing whatever it is they were doing, armed men would go with them. They would be just you know, make themselves as difficult a target as possible. So the war continued on into the spring with the Indian raid on Sudbury. Shortly after the raid on Sudbury came the Battle of Turner's Falls. And it was at Turner's Falls that the colonists actually went on the offensive, ambushing the Indians. Rather than looking for a straight up military style fight, they were the ones actually ambushing the native tribes. Captain William Turner of Massachusetts and about 150 of his fellow militiamen attacked an Indian village and killed about one to 200 natives. Captain Turner and about 40 of his men would be killed on their return from the falls when they themselves were ambushed by an Indian war party. Well, in any case, the Battle of Turner's Falls was the decisive moment in the battle. It was the turning point. The momentum had finally swung very firmly in the colonists' favor, and they went on the offensive along with their Mohican allies. They would be the ones raiding villages. They would be the ones that would be attacking enemy settlements and really carrying the war to the enemy. Now, this was occurring in the spring, which is planting season. So a favorite tactic would be to go to Indian planting land, uh, Indian cropland, and attack the Indians, the um, attack King Philip and his followers as they were trying to plant for the coming season, uh, really destroy the food source before it even could be grown. The Indian coalition was crumbling. Philip tried to hide in the Asawamset Swamp near Swansea, which is where the war had started. His allies were deserting him, and the colonials were hunting him down with the help of their Indian allies. Now, Philip did lash out a few more times throughout the summer, but the more efficient guerrilla tactics of the colonists minimized the damage. The colonists had adopted the tactics of the Indians, and they created specialized bands of men known as rangers to fight the enemy on their own terms. One such ranger company was led by Benjamin Church, who was assigned to track down Philip and his remaining band of warriors. Benjamin Church is also considered to be the father of American rangers, so there's that. In any case, Philip was eventually discovered by Benjamin Church and his band, or specifically an Indian scout working with Benjamin Church. And this Indian scout shot and killed Philip on August 12, 1676. Philip's body was dragged out of the swamp where it was hung, drawn, and quartered. I think that's a bit excessive, but they didn't ask my opinion. In any case, the body was chopped up and sent to various parts of New England as a warning to others, as a warning to those who would defy the colonies. Now, with King Philip dead, the war for all practical purposes ended. Uh, there were sporadic raids that went on a couple years on past this, but for the most part, the fighting was over. The total casualty count was about 1,000 dead on the colonial side and about 3,000 dead on the Indian side. Again, uh, records are somewhat spotty, but that's pretty much the best estimate anyone's ever been able to come up with. About 17 colonial settlements were completely destroyed. Uh, about 50 others or so were very badly damaged and needed extensive repair work. Now, if the colonials were damaged by this, the Indians were utterly broken. The Indians made off far worse. In addition to having larger numbers of their warriors and numbers of their population killed, they simply didn't have the numbers to replenish themselves anymore. They, their back was pretty much completely broken by the end of this. So overall, in terms of percentages of the population that was killed, King Philip's War is the deadliest war ever in American history. Now, as a final closing note, it's important to keep in mind that the English crown did not get involved directly. The colonists themselves, their militia, their own towns, you know, regular townsfolk, regular people, were the ones who actually participated in this war, not the government forces, or at least not the formal government forces in, in England. There were no redcoats present. They were entirely on their own. The colonists were forced to resolve the issues without the assistance of the government back in England, and some people have theorized that this has led to the independent streak that, well, give or take about a century from now, well, it's going to have some serious ramifications.
So that's the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hit the like and subscribe button if you thought this was interesting and entertaining. Um, sorry I couldn't go into King Philip's War in extensive detail. It would just take forever. Um, did what I could with the limitations. Wanted to keep it brief too. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. All right. See you later. Have a good day. Or don't. You're adults. Do whatever you like.